we are so glad that you guys are with us tonight. Uh, I'll say this, it's good for me to be back in the house tonight. I was out of town last weekend. I had to go out, spend a little bit of time trying to think about what we were going to be studying after we finished our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And then last weekend, Steph's little sister got married and they asked this guy to actually do the wedding. Now, I'll say this, it was a privilege, but it also was a privilege with lots of pressure, okay? Because if you mess that wedding up, they're never going to let you forget the end of it, you know? So you're going to have to live with that every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, every major holiday. And so thankfully that went well. Good news, I think I'm still in the family. Bad news, I'm confident I am no longer the favorite son-in-law, okay? She married some great guy, so it makes me look like garbage. So that's kind of my life in a nutshell over the last week. Tonight, we are back in the house, though, and we are concluding a series that we have been in for four weeks now, and it's called Making Bank. In fact, I was talking to one of the girls in the back right before service started. She says, you look like the guy who's my personal finance guy. And I said, I kind of am your personal finance guy. Like, we're talking about making bank. And like what we should be doing and what should be our perspective all about money. And so tonight we're kind of wrapping up that series again that we have been in for four weeks. Now, throughout the entire series, I have been honest with you about my intentions. Every week I've told you that my desire, my intentions in this series is to bust the myth about making bank. And the reason that I'm trying to do that is because I care about you. And what I do not want for you is I do not want you to spend large portions of your life or even all of your life chasing after wealth or trying to make bank only to come to the end of your life and, and realize that making bank really isn't all that it's cracked up to be or it's not all that you thought it would be. And yet that's the challenge for us is God's word says one thing, but culture says a completely different thing. Thing. In fact, I've said in this series that the prevailing view in our culture is that making bank is always seen as a really good thing. If there's an opportunity for you to make more money, then you should go after that opportunity with all that you have in you. But listen, more money is not always a great thing. It's not always the case. And yet the reason that we get sucked into the endless pursuit of more is because we are consumed with what money can do for us, but God is concerned about what money can do to us. And so for the next few minutes, I want to ask you to think about what money is really doing to you. And I want you to be really honest with yourself. And so I want to ask you a question, and here it is. Has making more money really produced more happiness in your life? I want you to think about it, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Has making more money really produced more happiness in your life? I suspect a lot of people would probably say no, but if you're on the yes side then I want you to think even further about how has it really produced more happiness in your life. Now, I want to frame the conversation tonight by saying this. I'm not asking you tonight to think with me about all of the problems that money can create in your life. And the reason I'm not going there is because I've already been there in this series. I've already acknowledged the passage in Scripture in the New Testament where we're told that a love of money is the root cause of all kinds of evil things in our lives, okay? So if I have a love for money, it can cause me to do all kinds of things that I probably shouldn't do, okay? We've seen people in the world who have literally killed over money. So some people kill over money. Some people will steal over money. Some people will compromise their values out of a pursuit of more money. Some people will work way too much because they want more money. Some people will neglect their families. Some people develop a greedy spirit. Some people become incredibly selfish. It's why so many people see things get really ugly in a divorce or really ugly when we're dividing up the family inheritance. All of these things are very real problems that creep into our lives when we get serious about making bank. And I just wanna say, as I frame the conversation tonight, I'm not asking you to think about the very real problems that come with making bank. 
But I am asking you tonight to think about the very empty promises that come with making bank. I believe that we have been lied to in our culture. I believe that we have been told that if you make more money, then you will experience more happiness and more joy in your life, and it's not true. So there's a guy named Timothy Keller. He's one of my favorite authors. He actually wrote a book called Counterfeit Gods. And in this book, he has a whole section on money, and he talks about, he describes why so many of us are intent on chasing after wealth or making massive amounts of money, or in our series, we would say, why we're so intent on making bank. Now, I want you to listen to what he says in the book. He wrote, money can be a surface idol that serves to satisfy more foundational impulses. Some people want lots of money as a way to control their world and life. Such people usually don't spend much money and live very modestly. They keep it all safely saved and invested so they can feel completely secure in the world. Others want money for access to social circles and to make themselves beautiful and attractive. These people do spend their money on themselves in lavish ways. Other people want money because it gives them so much power over others. In every case, money functions as an idol, and yet because of various deep idols, it results in very different patterns of behavior. Now, I want you to think about what he's saying, because what he's saying is that money in our lives is just the tip of the iceberg. Money is a problem that we can see on the surface level, but oftentimes there are things that are going on deeper inside of us that's driving this endless pursuit of getting more money or making a, a bigger check in the work that we do. And if you don't understand those deeper motivations, then you'll never really be able to see why you should be chasing after Jesus rather than spending your life chasing after wealth. And so he highlights them in that one paragraph. He says there's some people in the world who are chasing after wealth, and the reason they're chasing after it is because they're longing for security. There's some people who are chasing after wealth because they want to get into certain social circles. There, there's some people who are chasing after wealth because it gives them power and it makes them feel some sense of significance over other people who are now inferior to their superiority. There's different reasons, there's different motivations why all of us are chasing after the almighty dollar. And again, if we don't understand those underlying motivations, then it's difficult to see exactly why we should be chasing after Jesus rather than chasing after wealth. And this right here is why he called the book Counterfeit Gods, because he understands that a lot of us are holding on to this false sense of hope, believing that money will do something for us that in actuality only God can do for us. You need to know that making bank, it cannot deliver on what you need in your life the way that God can deliver on everything that you need in your life. And this is why I'm saying tonight that this whole philosophy that, that our world has embraced of like chasing bank or trying to make bank, it is full of empty promises. Now, I don't know about you, but one of my pet peeves in life is when people overpromise and then under deliver. That's exactly right. That, that really gets on my nerves. So when someone says, anybody with me on that? Or is that just, okay, thank you. One person is with me on that. Okay. A couple of you, okay, are, are with me on that now. Okay. So, so when I have somebody who comes to me and they tell me I can do a job and I can do it by this time, when they miss the deadline, gets on my nerves, incredibly frustrating for me. When someone tells me I can do a job for this price, 
And then they come in and they're trying to charge me a lot more. That's an incredibly frustrating experience for me. And yet there are a lot of people in the world, I think we would all agree, who are making promises that they don't plan on keeping or that they cannot keep. And I'm telling you tonight, the same is true with making bank. You have been led to believe and I have been led to believe that if we make bank, then we will be happy. And it's not true. It's an absolute lie. And so let me ask you again, has making more money really led to more happiness in your life? Think about it like this. If one of the keys to happiness in life is making bank, then Americans should be some of the happiest people on the planet. Okay, so I looked up some statistics this last week. Americans, right now, we have about one-third of the entire world's wealth in this country. 41% of all the millionaires in the world they live in this country. Now, most of us are not millionaires, and so let's kind of crack it down to our level, okay? So if you make $59,000 a year or more, then catch this. You make more money than 90% of the people in the world. And so if making bank is really supposed to make you happy, then Americans should be some of the happiest people on earth and you and I both know we're not we're not happy people we are actually depressed people I don't know if you know this or not but the number one prescription medication in America for years now antidepressants we're not happy we are literally doping ourselves up so that we can make it through another day in spite of the fact that we are one of the wealthiest nations on the earth. And this is why I'm saying tonight, there is no real correlation between more money and more happiness. It's a lie. And it's a lie that your spiritual enemy told you so that you would spend large portions of your life or maybe even all of your life chasing after wealth rather than chasing after Jesus. And this is why I'm asking you to rethink this whole idea of making bank with me. I want you to listen to what Solomon says, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, starting in verses 1 and 2. He said, I have seen... Another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. Now, throughout this book, Solomon is making notes in his memoirs, and he's making notes about the observations that he has made in the world throughout his lifetime. And one of the things that he sees is that there's some people in this world who have made a whole lot of money, but for some reason, they don't seem very happy. They don't seem to have the ability to enjoy their prosperity. And so he's looking specifically at the way in which people do life under the sun. And he notices something that most people never notice. He sees something that most people never see. He sees that God is the one who gives people their wealth and their possessions and their honor, but... He also sees that God is the one who gives people the ability to enjoy their wealth, their possessions, and their honor. You see, God isn't just the one who gives you the blessing. He is the one who gives you the ability or withholds from you the ability to actually enjoy the blessing. 
And this right here is why we can look at Hollywood and we can see so many people who are very, very wealthy, and yet at the same time, they are very, very unhappy. God has blessed them, and God has given them their wealth, but he has not given them the ability to enjoy that wealth. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe Solomon, just listen to some of these people who have made lots of money throughout the course of their lifetime. William Henry Vanderbilt. Name sound familiar? He was the oldest son of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was a prominent member of the Vanderbilt family, and he was the heir to his father's fortune. He said, and I quote, the care of 200 million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. So he had all kinds of wealth, but he had no ability to enjoy that wealth. Or think about Henry Ford. What, what did Henry Ford do? He, he spent his life building an automobile empire. And he comes to the end of his career after making massive amounts of money. And he said this, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. He had wealth, but he did not have the ability to enjoy that wealth. Andrew Carnegie, he once observed that millionaires seldom smile. He, like Solomon, is just making observations in his world, and he's scratching his head going, man, something's not right. Like, like these people who have all this money, these millionaires who are walking around, they, they never even crack a smile. John D. Rockefeller said, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. See, what these guys experienced is what Solomon has been calling chasing after the wind. They spent their whole lives chasing after something that they thought would bring happiness, that they thought would produce joy or bring satisfaction, and they never could experience it. Now, why would God do that? Why on earth would God give somebody all kinds of wealth and then say, I'm not going to give you the ability to even enjoy that wealth? Because he loves people. He gives people wealth, but then he withholds the ability to enjoy the wealth because he loves them and he wants a relationship with them. And so one of the ways that God works is he gives people what they think they want. To use Solomon's words, he gives them so much wealth and so much possessions that they have, what did he say? They have everything their hearts desire. So they have all the wealth, they have all the possessions, they have everything they ever want, but there's no pleasure in it. And eventually what happens, if that's your experience in life, you start to think things like this. There has to be something more. Eventually, you start to think, okay, like I, I've spent all my time chasing after money, trying to accumulate massive amounts of wealth, trying to make my first million by the time I'm 30, trying to get to a certain bank account, trying to get to a certain retirement account. There's no joy in this. There's no pleasure in it. There's no happiness in it. And you really start to think there has to be more to life than just this. There's got to be something more than just making bank. And this is one of the ways in which God is working to bring people and draw people to himself. He wants to help people make the discovery. He wants people to have their eyes opened to the fact that what they're really looking for in this life is not something that can be found in the world. It's not something that you put in your bank account. What you're really looking for can only be found in a relationship with him. And so what he does is he sets it all up. And he says, you can't enjoy the blessings of God apart from a relationship with God. And Solomon's looking at his world. Solomon's trying to make sense of what he's seeing. And this is the problem that he sees. And the reason I know that is because Solomon comes back to this phrase that he's used many times throughout the book. He's talking about life under the sun. See, when you 
are focused only on that which is under the sun, then you are ignoring the God who lives beyond the sun. And Solomon is teaching us that when we do that, you can have the blessings of God, but you cannot enjoy the blessings of God. Now, most people, they do not understand this truth in Ecclesiastes because, like Solomon, we're all focused on that which is under the sun. And so what happens to us is we have these experiences, we chase after wealth, we receive blessings of possessions and honor, and then something doesn't feel quite right. We're still unhappy. We're still miserable. And when that happens, what we do is we start trying to work our way up rather than just pausing and looking up. We never even consider the possibility that the missing piece from our lives, that the reason that we're not happy is because God is not really the priority in our lives. Instead, what we think is that I just haven't climbed the ladder high enough. I just don't have enough money. I just haven't got high enough up on the ladder of success. And so we work more, we climb higher, we try to make more, we try to land that promotion thinking that once we get there, then I will have wealth and I'll have the ability to enjoy that wealth. And I'm telling you, it's not true. You wouldn't really enjoy the, the wealth. In fact, I want to teach you something about the ladder of success that most people never even think about. So some people are climbing the ladder of success and they get all the way to the top and they go, are you kidding me? Is this it? Is this all there is to life? Is there really no satisfaction in making more money? But other people who are climbing the ladder of success, they have a completely different experience in their life. They start to experience things that also drive them into a relationship with God, or at least that's God's intention. See, the higher you go, here's your lesson on the ladder of success. The higher you go on the ladder of success, the bigger the pinch. The, the higher you go on the ladder of success, the bigger your company gets, the bigger your job you're thinking about the money that's at the top, the power that's at the top, and the happiness that's at the top. But I want you to know what's really at the top. What's really at the top is more demands on your time, more pressure that you're going to be under, more criticism that you're going to receive, more deadlines that you're going to have to meet, more responsibility that you have to take, and more conflict that you are going to have to resolve. And so if you're climbing the ladder, if you're that young buck who's getting ready to conquer the world, and you're going to be the CEO of your company, or you're trying to be the head of your department, or you're going to open up your own business, and you're going to make all kinds of money. If that's you, and you're thinking that the only thing at the top is more happy, more money, more power, then you have no idea what you're in for. If you're sitting there pushing your husband or pushing your spouse or pushing your wife to, to get that promotion or to apply for that bigger, better job or go to a bigger, better company, then you need to know on the front end of that that you're not just going after more money, more power, more happiness. You're signing up for more responsibility, more criticism, more pressure, more time in the office. And the higher you go, the more you will start to ask the question, is it even really worth it? That's where Solomon goes. Very next verse, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Listen to what he said. He said, a man may have a hundred children. He may live many years. Yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive a proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, 
It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. In Solomon's culture, they believed that there were only three things that you needed to be happy in life. You needed wealth, what we're talking about tonight. They believed that you needed a house full of kids, and they believed that you needed a really long life. And if you just had those three things, that, that's all it takes in order for you to be happy. And so here comes Solomon, wisest mortal man who ever lived, and he's going to challenge that, that, that notion. He's going to challenge that very common thought in his culture. And so what he does is he says, let's just take it to the extremes, okay? You think a house full of kids is going to make you happy? I'll give you a hundred kids. Now, already I'm out. I'm like, that, that doesn't sound fun to me, okay? Like, I love kids. I'm like, Jesus, like, Jesus loved kids, but I do not want a hundred children, okay? Like, more kids leads to more problems. I can't live with that. So he says, let's give you a hundred kids, you think that a long life is what it takes for you to be happy? Then here's what I'll do. I'll give you a thousand years twice over. So I'm giving you 2,000 years that you can live on the earth. You think that wealth is what's going to make you happy? I'll give you all the wealth that you could ever enjoy. But then he says this. If you can't enjoy your prosperity, then you're going to be asking yourself the question, is it really worth it? In fact, to make his point, Solomon makes a very radical claim. He says that if a man cannot enjoy his prosperity, he is worse off than a stillborn child. Now, a stillborn child never makes any great accomplishments. But a stillborn child never has any great regrets either. And Solomon's just looking at people who are chasing after wealth all of their life and there's no joy in it. And Solomon is saying that a stillborn child is better off than the man who works his whole life chasing after the empty promises of making bank. It's frustrating to work your whole life for money that you can't even enjoy because you're doing life apart from God. It's frustrating to spend your whole life trying to get to the top, thinking at the top there's just going to be more money, more power, and more happiness, only to discover that it's a lot more of stuff, but it's a lot more of the bad stuff, not the good stuff. It's just a lot more problems, not, not just a lot more money. And if you struggle with that, eventually you will come to the place in your life when you're asking yourself the question, like Solomon did, is it even worth it? And let me tell you something about people in our world right now. I think there are a lot of people in our world right now who have been spending their lives chasing after the almighty dollar in this country, and they're starting to realize it's not worth it. In fact, we are living right now in 2021 in a season that experts are calling the Great Resignation. Anybody heard of the Great Resignation? Let me see your hands. Anybody, one or two of you have heard. This is a real thing. In fact, if you Google on your phone the Great Resignation, and then it will fill it in, and it will call it the Great Resignation of 2021. Listen to what's happening. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, from the beginning of March... Until the end of July, 19 million Americans quit their jobs in this country. A lot of different sources that I read this week reported that approximately 95% of Americans are thinking about quitting their jobs right now. So I spent a lot of time reading about the great resignation this week. And there's a lot of reasons why people think that so many people just want to quit their job or they already quit their job, okay? And part of it is because they see that COVID gave people an opportunity to step away for a little while and to really think about what they're doing with their work, 
to really think about what they're giving their life to and whether or not it's really worth it. And millions upon millions upon millions of Americans are starting to conclude that it isn't really worth it. The money isn't worth it because I'm not even enjoying it. The work isn't worth it because it's not even what I thought that it would be. I'm just taking on more problems. It's not worth it. And if that's the way that you feel right now, you need to know that you will never find what you're really looking for by simply changing jobs. You may run to another job and you may find more money. You may find more flexibility. You may find the opportunity to work from anywhere in the world, work remotely for the rest of your life. You may find a place that gives you incredible benefits for you and for your family, but you won't be able to enjoy the blessings of God apart from a relationship with God. But when you make your relationship with God the number one priority in your life, He gets to a different place with you. He no longer has to eliminate the things that are competing for your love, that are competing for your time, that are competing for your attention. And so now God is in a position where He can give you the blessing and He can give you the ability to actually enjoy the blessing. See, when your relationship with God is the priority in your life, He can help you deal with the increased pressure, the increased responsibility, the increased criticism without cracking up and going crazy along the way. You don't have to spend the rest of your life just running from one job to another job, always uprooting your family and living with so much uncertainty because you believed that the grass was greener on the other side only to discover that it really wasn't. It's all about being in a relationship with God. And so when you're in a relationship with God, you don't have to run from reality because God gives you the ability to deal with the demands of reality. And so I want to end the series tonight by reading you three verses that the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament. And I want to end here because I think it's the Apostle Paul's way of saying, I do not want Christians to miss this. In the transition from Old Testament to New Testament, from Judaism to Christianity, I do not want this really important message to be lost. And so he sends this message to a young pastor named Timothy who was leading a Christian community in the city of Ephesus. And this is what he told him. He said, Timothy, I want you to command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. That's his way of saying making bank is making a lot of empty promises. It's uncertain. You cannot really bank on it, for lack of better words. But instead, they need to put their hope in God because God is the one who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves treasures, treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. And let me tell you, That's what I want for you. I want you to experience life that is truly life. Jesus called it the abundant life. That's the kind of life that I want you to experience. That's what God wants you to experience. I don't want you living with the frustration of empty promises. Because you were told that that making bank was going to be all of that. And so you chased after wealth rather than chasing after Jesus, only to to discover that the world was over-promising and under-delivering on what making bank was really going to be like. God wants you to experience life that is truly life. And Paul tells us how we can get that kind of life. Paul says, stop putting your hope in wealth. 
Stop looking at wealth as though it can give you security when only God can really give you security. Stop looking at wealth going, it will give me significance when only God can really give you significance. Stop looking to wealth to find that sense of acceptance in social circles when God is the only one who can really accept you because he knows the worst about you and he loves you more than anybody else. That's true acceptance. And it's not found in wealth. It is only found through a relationship with God that is made available to you and me freely through the grace of his son, Jesus Christ. He wants you to have life. He wants you to take hold of life that is truly life by becoming more like Jesus, who was not just a consumer, but he lived his life as a contributor. He wants you to take hold of life that is truly life by living your life like God, who thought more about others than he even thought about himself. And all of this is discovered, not in chasing after money, but in chasing after Jesus. And so let me end the series by just asking you this. How's your relationship with God? I'm not asking you, do you go to church? I don't even care about religion. I'm asking you, how is your relationship with God? Has it been neglected because you're so busy, you're so focused on making bank that you hadn't really been thinking much about having a relationship with God that could be great and satisfying so that you don't just have the blessings of God, you're able to actually enjoy the blessings of God? Let me ask you this. Do you even have a relationship with God? Look, we do church in a different way because we want to attract people into this building. We want to attract viewers online who would say, I don't even think I have a relationship with God. I've never put my faith in Jesus. I've never asked God to forgive my sins and to become the one who is the leader of my life. And if that's you, then tonight, right where you sit, just put your faith in Jesus. Just tell God, God, I need Jesus in my life. I need Jesus to forgive my sins. I need Jesus to lead my life. I need Jesus to help me find the kind of joy that this guy's talking about because I'm not experiencing it in my life right here, right now. And I'll tell you this about Jesus. Jesus, he is the the only way to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. I don't care what anyone else in the world tells you. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus taught. If there was any other way for you to have a relationship with God, then God would not have asked His Son Jesus to step down out of heaven and to walk on the earth. He would not have asked His Son to die on a cross in Rome. Almost 2,000 years ago, it was a miserable death. He would have never asked his son to do those things if there was any other way. And this right here is why I want you to spend your life chasing after Jesus rather than chasing after wealth. At the beginning of the service, we sang a song where we kept singing about Jesus there was this line over and over again. She sang it, kept talking about Jesus being worthy. You know what we said about making bank? We said it's not worth it. But let me tell you something about chasing after Jesus. It's always worth it. And so if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then right here, right now, just put your faith in him and ask him to make you right with the heavenly father so that you can find joy in this life and joy in the blessings that he gives you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we um, just thank you for every second. We thank you for every penny that you've given us. God, more than a million years or a million dollars, we're grateful that we have you and your love in our lives. God, I ask that you would help us to use our time and our resources in a way that reflect your goodness, in a way that reflects your character. God, we give you thanks tonight that we can gather together and worship, that we can get together and experience you, feel you, see you, be a part of all the good things that you want to give to your people as you pour yourself out into our lives. God, I just pray for those who do not know Jesus. I pray that today would be their day, that right now this would be their moment, that they would realize that there's only really satisfaction in knowing Christ and that if we would just seek him, that everything else would fall into place. And so God, put in them just a little bit of faith so that they can take that step tonight. If that's you, I pray, I pray, I pray that you'll communicate with us about the fact that you put your faith in Jesus. You can join um, 
Online, we have a, a new to faith website that will just kind of help you understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You can take the connect card that's in that seat pocket in front of you. You can fill that out. You can let us know by checking a box at the bottom of that card. It says, I put my faith in Jesus today. That's a defining moment in your spiritual journey. And as a church, we want to walk with you in the days ahead. So fill that card out and drop that off in the black boxes as you make your way out. God, I just pray that everything we've taught over this series would linger in our minds and in our hearts. I pray that you would transform us from the inside out that you would bust the myth about making bank once and for all so that we would see money the way that you see money. And I pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.